Um, so could you just introduce yourself briefly? Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Silva Mino. Uh, I'm um, uh, engineer in uh, and uh, working, you know, in open source, uh, on open source projects uh, and, you know, on non-open source projects as well. Um, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of stuff in the uh, open FPGA uh, things, mostly on, uh, on ICE 40. Um, and I applied for the shuttle, for the Sky 130 shuttle. And this is your yeah. first ASIC, isn't it? Yes, so that's the first ASIC. I have a lot of experience with uh, FPGAs. That's, uh, that's how I actually started. Uh, my first work was as a FPGA designer. And so I've got a lot of experience in uh, digital design and, and that kind of stuff. But it was only FPGA. I've never done any kind of ASIC work. And so I'm just uh, discovering all of that um, from scratch, basically. Yeah. And what was the thing that got you excited about applying for the shuttle? Uh, well, so when I first saw the, um, the announce by Tim, uh, Tim Ansel, uh, about the, the open PDK, I thought it, it was interesting, but I, at that time it was just the release of the PDK, right? So it, it, it was, it was just announced, okay, we're going to release the, the, the development kit, um, the design kit, sorry, I think. Yeah, PDK. Um, yeah, so actually, yeah. just for for people that aren't are not from the ASIC world, the uh, process design kit is all the bits that you need to build up an ASIC. So, like an, in particular, it includes all the all the tiny building blocks, the standard cells like flip flops and AND gates and OR gates. But yeah, exactly. The simulation and the spice models and all this kind of stuff. But at that time, I didn't actually know that there was. Um, I mean, it, it wasn't uh, targeted at, at Sky120, but I didn't know that there was any kind of tooling available at all in the Opposition It's reward. So, uh, so I thought, okay, like great, they released the, the, the design kit, but we can't use it anyway because we don't have a software stack. Yeah. And it's not, I mean, it's still gonna cost, uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of euro to get a chip manufactured. So, you know, it's a, it's a nice first step, but I kind of watched it from a distance, right? Um, and then a bit a bit later on, I actually learned that uh, there was some open tooling available. Um, and then a little bit after that, I learned that uh, they were doing a shuttle where you could um, actually get your ship manufactured. And that that got my interest because that's something that I never thought I'd be able to do, um, especially with uh, you know. Um, open source course that I developed and, uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I kind of jumped at the chance um, because it's always interesting to do stuff that you've never done before. Yeah. And, um, you know, being from the FPGA world, uh, like doing a bunch of, of digital design and stuff, I can, I can implement most of that in FPGA, but there is a bunch of analog stuff or, or slightly, you know, kind of at the boundary between digital and uh, and analog, the kind of you know clock domain recovery, that kind of stuff, which have t tiny little bit of uh, analog part in them that um, I can't do in FPGA. Like if I want to do that in FPGA, I basically I'm basically relying on the vendor to provide me a hard IP that does this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and here it's kind of my chance to design one, see how they work, and maybe it's going to work, maybe not. We'll see. Yeah. So let's move on. And um, could you explain what your um, your design is for the shuttle. Right. Very, so, very brief overview. Right. So the, um, the original plan was to make like an entire sock with a bunch of, of peripherals uh, okay. with the aim of targeting um, circuit Python or, or micro Python and have a, a bunch of useful peripherals for that, uh, for that thing, um, including like memory controller and that kind of stuff. Um, unfortunately, like the, the tooling isn't quite there yet. It's, it still takes a, a lot of uh, effort to get uh, small designs uh, working. And um, one thing that's missing in particular at the moment is we don't have uh, SRAMs, or, or rather we don't have the SRAM compiler. So uh, that's still something that's being uh, tested and, and still needs to be validated in hardware. And we were kind of waiting for that before really starting because we wanted to see, okay, what kind of timing are we going to get with the SRAM, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That never came. Like, uh, so we're still 
waiting. And so we kind of downgrade it a bit just to basically get a first design um, on this shuttle that's going to test um, mostly the USB. So uh, I have a, a USB 2, uh, a U, I mean USB 1.1, like full speed um, um, device core that I orig originally wrote for the ICE 40, but that's um, kind of especially, that's well suited for ASIC in the sense that all the endpoint and that kind of stuff is dynamically reconfigurable. Um, if you look at some of the available USB cores that are available, available for FPGAs, um, some of them you need to kind of pre-configure the endpoint when you generate the Verilog or when you ge generate the netlist. Uh, and that's perfectly fine for an FPGA core, right? Because you can just easily can change the configuration, it. right? But for an ASIC, being able to change all of that uh, at runtime is obviously great because you can't easily resynthesize it. So you're uh, leveraging the um, Pico RV32 that comes in the carrier yes. kind of extended pad. Room, that's that's what we do. Firmware in there that's going to configure your endpoints. Exactly. Yeah. We we just have. Uh, um, we just have peripherals on the wishbone bus that they expose, and we're we're planning to use the the CPU that they provide because I mean it's there. chances that it's going to be working, right? Yeah. Um, Otherwise, nothing's going to work. Yeah, exactly. So since that was the first kind of step, uh, we preferred relying on that rather than trying to to make our own um, CPU core, especially since the the kind of CPU core that we would have liked to target. Um, we would have needed like uh, SRAM blocks for register file and that kind of stuff uh, so or cache. To that. And so, yeah, we're planning on, on trying that um, next time, hopefully. Um, and on this design, we also added a, a couple of other peripherals like sound, uh, media output, and some basic video. But that, that was really just to try to fill out the silicon because just the USB core, it, it, it looked very, uh, like a small amount of silicon. Very lonely. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, and so we figured, okay, I basically allocated like one day or, 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 or like a week ago. Okay, I have one day to write like an audio or video core. Yeah just for this shuttle it's probably never gonna get reused again uh, but uh. yeah so that's a good point actually so you spent like a, a day on the um hdl and then how many days on actually getting your files ready for the oh yeah, yeah. That, that took like a what's the ratio a, about two weeks uh okay. yeah so yeah like that's when i started say seriously um i basically took two day, two weeks of, of work yeah. to to work on that. The original plan was to just take the Relog, synthesize it, and then work on... Um, I wanted to to make like an optimized uh, latch-based memory um, with like hand layout and hand routing, uh, that, that kind of block. Um, and that's that's something I talked about if you, when the PDK first came out. I, I, I made a stream about uh, looking at OpenDB, uh, trying to trying that out. Um, and for me, it didn't work out like that uh, because uh, it turned out that getting a, a design through the flow uh, uh, turned out to be much more uh, uh, painful than uh, originally anticipated. Um, <laughs> and um, and so yeah, I mostly spend my t my time fixing issues and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Could you um, show us your final GDS files on a screen share and just talk us through like multiple uh, blocks? Sure, I can, uh, let me grab Kelly out. Okay, so that's the entire chip, right? Um, where you mostly, let, is there a way to? I mean, this machine is pretty powerful and it still yeah. takes like a lot of- uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is not just internet lag. This is actually, it is- like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things. I mean, the, the GDS is like 300 megabytes, right? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna hide the text so that it's um, a little more visible. Um, so that's the entire chip. Um, obviously on the side, you see all the IO pads and the power ring that's distributing the power all around the chip. Mm -hmm. and the uh, actually interface to the outside, uh, the pads, which are basically doing the voltage translation between the core voltage and the inside. 
So all of this is the Caravel. So you have the two uh, kilobyte SRAM and the uh, Pico RV there. And that's the design um, that I made that's kind of lost in the entire user area. Yeah. So you, you have all of this space available and I'm just using this small okay, part. So let's, let's zoom in on and, that. Um, and so that's the, oh wait, I actually okay. opened the wrong file. I wanted to open just Pi 5. Yeah, that's the the design okay. itself that uh, that we did. So the the eight blocks that you see there are the uh, SRAM blocks. So currently we only have one uh, pre-made block that we can use if we want some SRAMs. That's the only one that's been kind of uh, pre-made for us and pre-approved, which is like. A, um, 256 by 32 bits um, with one read write port and one read port. Um, and that's the eight blocks that you see there. So the the way we use them is we have the, the three on the upper right here are used for the USB. Uh, one being a transmit buffer, uh, one other being the receive buffer, and then the third one is uh, storing the various uh, status of the endpoint, things like the buffer descriptors for the uh, the various buffer, and uh, if the endpoint is enabled, uh, if there is a packet pending, that kind of stuff. And it's also sto uh, storing um, the microcode for the transaction state machine of the um, of the of the USB logic, basically. Um, when I implement that core on FPGA, usually the, all the microcode is implemented as a ROM. Uh, but here, since I actually had some space in a SRAM, um, I figured I might as well make it reprogrammable uh, so that there is, if it turns out there's a bug in the microcode, I can just update the microcode um, once the, the ASIC is done, yeah. Um, and the big um, mess in the middle, that's and actually... So the, all of that is the the actual logic gates. Uh, let me see if I can uh, make a, see a drawing. That's uh, the thing is because unused unused uh, standard cell. So if if we just look at metal one drawing, for instance. Uh, so let's zoom in a part which doesn't actually have anything. Uh, here you see all the uh, standard cell. Uh, okay, here they're divided like in squares and that's basically the division where you can have either something or nothing mm -hmm. and that something can be an OR gate or a NAND gate or a flip-flop or whatever. All of these are empty, there's nothing in them. Uh, and the only thing you see are the blue rails, which are basically power, ground, power, ground, power, ground, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, and of course, here there is nothing and here you, you see there's a bunch of stuff that's because the so the blue one the blue line sorry I forgot to specify is the metal layer right that's a metal one called uh, that's the, the first metal layer metal layer yeah yeah and that's all the interconnect between the cell and you have several metal layers so to, it is metal one here it is metal two uh, metal three and metal four and there's a fifth metal layer um, and if you notice it's actually uh, it's X, Y routing. Like you have one layer which is rooted primarily horizontally, then one vertically, then another horizontally, then vertically. That's that's kind of the way they used to make PCBs mm -hmm. also uh, in the past. Like when you had a 74 logic, you had, you know, horizontal routing on one layer and then vertical routing on another. But that's kind of how it's done here. And that connects to all the cell. And you see the area which are mostly used and some which are mostly empty because this core is, in the end, very small. That's actually something that's, uh, when, when transitioning from FPGA to ASIC, it's the, the trade-offs that you have to make are completely different. Um, because like in the FPGA, I don't, I don't really have any problem using a block RAM because you know, I have 32 of them. Um, sometimes I can save some logic by using a block RAM, which I don't use here. The RAMs are huge, right? <laughs> <laughs> like compared to the logic, which means that um, if I had to do some trade-offs differently, I might actually prefer, okay, not to use a RAM and instead use some more logic because mm. 
not only there are area where there is absolutely nothing in them, even in the area where you have something, um, I mean, you can't really see it here uh, on the final GDS, but uh, um, there's actually a bunch of unused space with absolutely nothing in them. Uh, I don't know if you can, yeah, like if you look, uh, let me just show this. Okay, so here when so you so have like a, a, a polysilicon now. Yeah, exactly, that's the polysilicon layer. Um, when you have a bunch of uh, like a fork stuff, that's that's a transistor. Mm. That's the that's actually the gate of the transistors. Um, and the and big you, pads so you can see the capacitors. And and those big pads are basically the coupling capacitors which are put there when there is nothing else to put. Like mm. you might you might as well use the area for something. And so uh, as one of the final step is that it fills the uh, unused area with a, a bunch of decoupling capacitor. And you can see that there is a bunch of them, so which means that there is a bunch of actually free space that isn't used by anything. Mm. Um, but at some point, you also hit the fact that um, you're not limited by the area of the silicon that you have to make transistor. You're limited by the fact that you need to route metal in and out of those areas. Yeah. Uh, and it becomes crowded pretty quickly. Uh, so you, you'll you never reach like a density of 100%. That's just not going to happen. Yeah, it's more like um, kind of 35%. That seems to be like the average that people are using in the open lane configuration. Yeah, I think uh, currently here I have about 40%. Uh, you have to also to account for the fact that when you configure density of 40% in open lane, you end up with a slightly higher density than that because you have the diodes that get added and the, uh, uh, the tap... Uh, cells um, so okay to explain the tap cells are special cells that need to be uh, placed regularly in the chip so that the bulk and the and the well so that like the the p zones and the end zones of, of your chip basically are properly biased and you don't have you know what's called latch up uh, which would um, basically destroy your chip and so you need to periodically Put those on the on the die, and you are in the PDK. There is a specification that says, okay, you need a tap cell every, I think it's every 15 microns or something. You need you need one of them, um, and so you'll you'll find one of those uh, every every so often. I don't know if you can actually see. That would be an example of one of the DRC rules that come in the PDK. Exactly, that's one of the uh, the rules that you have to. Uh, they're actually pretty visible. I think these are okay. These are tap drawing. So here you see, you, periodically you have one every so often, and you never go very far without seeing one next to, so you, you use uh, quite some area for that. Um, and the other, the other thing is uh, that I mentioned is uh, diodes, which are the, uh, uh, yeah, exactly, the antenna rules. So the, the, the general idea is that when you build all those metal layers, uh, they're not built all of all at once, right? The metal one is built, and then metal two is built, and then one after the other, they are uh, plated, uh, deposited, and then etched. Um, and so it can happen that uh, a gate of one of your MOSFET is gonna be connected to nothing, except like a very long wire, which isn't yet connected to what's gonna drive that wire. And that's basically a floating gate and a floating gate on a MOSFET is uh, susceptible to um, electrostatic discharge, especially since the, the process to build those, those layer implies, uh, you know, some of them are use uh, what's called uh, like a plasma polishing. etching. Yeah, uh, and, and, and polishing and that kind of stuff, which can generate charges. And so if you have a, a piece of metal that's long enough to collect ch enough charges uh, to cause an ESD discharge, through your MOSFET gates, you can destroy your transistors before they're before you even uh, get built. It hand. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so you need to basically put like an ESD protection diode right next to your transistors on the chip itself uh, to prevent that from happening. Um, and that takes up some area. Yeah. That's also something that, you know, the, the commercial tools are, are much better at doing that intelligently than currently the methods that are being used in the uh, open source tools. At least that's what I hear. Like I have no experience whatsoever with the commission but Not tools. many of us have had access to these tools. Yeah, exactly. I've never even seen one running. So. Great. Okay. So, well, thanks so much for your time and explanation here.
Sure, no problem. Um, uh, I'll put a link up to your design. That's one of the cool things about the shuttle is all the designs have to be open source. So yeah. to learn from what everyone else is doing. Um, and yeah, have a great weekend. Yeah, have a good weekend too. Bye. Cheers.